Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Hey Go Have a Good One. My name is Samuel, and just before doing this recording, I got an ad for a High School Musical the Musical the series on Disney+. Plus. What? Why? <laughs> I had a... I, surprisingly enough, I was planning on starting off this episode a little bit differently, but then that thing came up, and I was like, what? on earth is this? High School Musical, the musical, the seri- <laughs> Oh my gosh. And this isn't even related to what we're actually doing today, but like, far out, what the heck is up with that? Like, I mean, that ought to be interesting to find out about. Somehow I feel as though a lot of YouTube critics are going to have a lot of stuff to say about this show. Or maybe they won't. Who's who's to say? But anyway, uh, here I am supposed to be looking at um, Panic at the Disco's fifth album, Death of a Bachelor. Now, I think, actually, from memory, I think, yeah, no, this is actually the very first Panic album um, that shares its name directly with one of the songs in the album, um, like, um, what is it, uh, Too Weird to Live, Too Rare to Die kind of shares its name with, uh, what is it, Far Too Young to Die, but, like, you know, it's not exactly the same thing. Vices and Virtues and A Fever You Can't Sweat Out aren't, like, they aren't even name-dropped at all, and Pretty Odd is at least... Uh, name dropped at some point in it. But anyway, after the last album, Too Weird to Live, Too Rare to Die, the drummer of the band, Spencer Smith, left... Well, actually, he left the band. He let the band go because he loved it. With Spencer gone, Brendan became the only original band member left, and Death of a Bachelor marked the first album by Panic as a solo project by Brendan, rather than an actual band. That's why from... That's why now, if you were to Google Panic at the Disco up on Google, because where else would you Google something, you will end up finding that they describe Panic at the Disco as like, I think it's like a pop rock solo project by Brendan Yuri. Used to be a band, not anymore, this is why. They'd been dropping like flies Anyway, um, how did it go uh, at the box office? It's not a movie, but how did it go at the box office? Well, uh, Death of a Bachelor debuted at number one on the US Billboard 200 with 190,000 album units, earning the band its best sales week and first number one album. Wait, so, wait. So this was the first album they did that actually reached number one? Dang, alright. Uh, the album has been certified double platinum by the Recording Industry Association of America, or the RIA, for sales of at least two million copies. It was nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Rock Album at the 59th Annual Grammy Awards. Oh, dang. Did it win? Well, I guess it didn't, but... Uh... Let me see, let me see, um, let's see, best rock album, here we go, uh, yeah, okay, so it was apparently, uh, nominated, uh, but it was beaten by, uh, the album Tell Me I'm Pretty by a band called Cage the Elephant, I've never actually heard of that, but, uh, Weezer, and Blink-182 were also nominated. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, anyway. So, uh, this is also the first album in a while with no bonus songs. We haven't had one of those since Pretty Odd. I guess Brendan moved past that phase now. So, it should be a simpler situation here. I don't really have to worry about, like, you know, What's the last song meant to be, and all of that kind of stuff. At least I don't have to worry about that here. Um, this album is apparently 
about Brendan... It's apparently Brendan getting back to his roots. Imagine hearing an artist say that. But being able to move forward in a new light, in a brand new era, as a brand new person. And apparently, there's lots of inspiration for this album from, like, Frank Sinatra, Queen, and Bruce Springsteen. Uh, this album seems to follow a party going from the highest of heights to then mellowing out as the party reaches its end. That's what I gathered listening to it anyway. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, song names that you probably will have recognized because there's actually quite a few, like a lot of their most popular songs are actually from this album. Uh, anyway, um, so let's start off with um, the opening song to the album, Victorious. So we get some chanting uh, with a clap beat, making for a, a nice start, you know, nice like grinning. And then we get an explosive opening. Also, that note at the end of the intro that Brendan hits, it is held for so long. I'd, I don't know exactly how long it's actually held for, but it is very impressive how long he actually holds that note for. Very impressive, Brendan. Um, it seems like we, this song has lyrics similar to some of their older songs, as in there doesn't seem to be much relation to the words that are actually being used. Um, let me, let me get up an example, actually. Uh, let me get the lyrics up. So, uh, double, double, uh, far out, get out of the way. Double bubble disco queen headed to the gil to the guillotine skin as cool as steve mcqueen let me be your killer king it hurts until it stops we will love until it's not i'm a killing spree in white eyes like broken christmas lights what on earth is the correlation here definitely seems very similar like however all right i will say that despite how wordy the verses can get in this song I would never say that it's too much, like Fever You Can't Sweat Out was like. Like, those, a lot of the songs in that was like, it seemed as though he was trying to rush to stay on beat. Here, it still sounds perfectly filled. Uh, we get a nice choir. Uh, I mean, wait, yes, that is actually what I meant to write. We get a nice choir uh, hitting some high notes uh, after the bit that's like, uh like, wide until it stops, and then we get, like, <laughs> not like that. It sounds better in the actual song. You should listen to it and get a bit of an idea there. Um, the chorus almost sounds less manic than the verses. Uh, Brendan kind of, like, slows down his singing, and it's, like, a lot of the instrumental kind of, like, pulls back. And can I just say, this song is very loud. I might have been playing it very loud, but it is very loud. Uh, the verses then seem to kind of dial back from the explosiveness. What the heck? Okay. I just realized I've got steam coming out of my mouth, despite the fact that I am inside, indoors, in a rather warm room. How does that work? I don't get steamy breath. It seems... As in, I don't understand it. It seems to show up out of nowhere. Anyway! Uh, yeah, the verses seem to dial back from the explosiveness. Uh, quite a bit. Uh, then we get... Oh, the, for the lyric, I taste like magic. We get a... Well, I mean, for one, it's a weird choice for lyrics. How does magic taste? Uh, but whatever they do with magic sounds sick. It's like, that tastes like magic. You know what? Maybe I should just stop trying. Anyway, then we have... So, the lyrics 50 words for murder, and I'm every one of them. What on earth is that meaning here? <laughs> are we are we getting a, um, a Franklin Silverhammer Beatles type of vibe going on here? Also, can I say, the chorus, that chorus really slaps. We get a strong beat with a lot of, like, techno beep-boops in it. It's a very full sound to it. Uh, and then we get some trumpets within, like, some point. Unexpected, but a nice welcome. Uh, the third chorus then pulls everything back, 
But that kind of makes the drop a little less impactful, I feel. I don't know. I, like, I know that that's not how it's supposed to work, but, like, I don't know. It just kind of lost the impact for me somehow. Uh, this song, Victorious, very much encapsulates how the start of a party feels. It's strong, bombastic, explosive, not really making too much sense, and not really caring about that, just living in the moment. Um, apparently this song is about how Brendan was never really great at sports, but the passion he brought always made up for it, apparently. It's all of, it's not about the, what is it? It's not about the, the something in the fight, it's about the fight in the kid. I, I, I don't remember how the saying goes. It's all about that passion. And I suppose I can see that, like, as that being the interpretation. But honestly, I think it works in the party context better. So, in this instance, I'm just going to go ahead and enforce death of the author and just be like, I'm correct. Anyway, I give... So anyway, I... Oh yeah, I always forget to do this. So... I'm now going to give, for those of you who don't know, who aren't familiar with this, I'm now going to give each song a score out of 10. Basically, uh, a score, any score that's above 6 means that I really like the song, and I would go out of my way to listen to it again. Uh, anything between a 4 and a 6 um, means that I think the song is kind of meh, I probably wouldn't go out of my way to listen to it, but if it just showed up randomly, I probably wouldn't skip it. Um, and then any song that is below a 4 means that I really don't like the song, and I wouldn't go out of my way to listen to it ever, and even if I it showed up on the radio randomly, I would much rather, like, skip it or change the channel rather than listen to it. So, with that in mind, I would give Victorious an 8.5 out of 10. This song is such a strong opening. The energy di uh, the energy kind of dips at times, and the lyrics are kind of weird, but the energy never really drops completely, and the lyrics are kind of part of the charm at this point. So yeah, Victorious, 8.5 out of 10. Is that the strongest opening that we've gotten? No, actually, no. I think, no, I think from memory, I think uh, Ballad of Mona Lisa, I think, had just as high of a score. I think. I could be wrong about that. Uh, but it'll take a while to check that. So let's just move on with the next song. Don't threaten me with a good time. First of all, can I just say, um, this title sounds like the, like, just don't threaten me with a good time. It sounds like the mantra of a chaotic neutral character. Like, I'm imagining that this is what's going on in a chaotic neutral character's head when they're just like, Alright, off I go to commit a crime I've never done before. Uh, so, we get an opening guitar riff, which is a sample from Rock Lobster. Uh, it's a cool opening. Also, I've heard a live version of this song uh, that makes it dirtier and better. So it's like... I think it's, like, in the live version that I've listened to, uh, they play this, like, Rock Lobster thing, uh, on, like, an electric guitar, but it's, like, the electric guitar is, like, dirtier. So you get, like, a really nice sound to it. I guess I could describe it as, like, grit, but for a guitar, and it sounds better that way. Uh, this riff still sounds really cool, but I have to give this credit to B-52, which, who are the peeps that made the riff for Rock Lobster. Um, the refrain is quite energetic and loud, not as much so as Victorious, but still quite a bit. Then we get a big pullback for the verses. It is so much quieter during the verses. Like, at first it's like only piano playing. That's how much of a pullback we're dealing with here. We still get some strong drum beats during the verses. Sick. Then the guitar starts to come back in. Um, and then we get 
the chorus, which starts off with champagne, cocaine, gasoline. What the heck? That's such a... You know what? That is such a, like, memorable, uh, uh, line. <laughs> it's so memorable. Champagne, cocaine, gasoline, and most things in between. Like, ah! It's so, like... It's so memorable. Like, it's very hard to forget that. Um, also, I had a thought that, um, going from, like, really loud chorus to, like, really quiet verses almost sounds like, uh, it's almost like the main person or, like, the protagonist of this song is, like, snapping out of a high during the verses. It pulls back so quickly and he's just like, who are these people? What are these footprints? They don't look very human-like. And then quickly builds back up to another high during the chorus, where he's like, champagne, cocaine, gasoline. But like, you know, belting it. Uh, the guitar still sounds really cool. Um, also, I gotta commend it. The lyrics in this song are really catchy and clever, particularly, um... I told you time and time again, I'm not as thick as you drunk I am. First time I heard that, I was like, oh, that's clever. I prefer the lyrics in this song to Victorious. I don't know, it's just very clever. Also, there's like a whistle sound that comes in in the final verse, I think. Uh, in general, the final verse adds a couple more layers to the sound, which obviously we all like our layers. Um... Found out, so I found out that this song was actually released on the, on 2015 New Year's Eve as an instant download for those who had already pre-ordered the album from digital music retailers. So, there's that. I suppose, in a way, it, what this song kind of is like a bonus song, almost. Except it isn't the original song. It's like... You got it immediately if you pre-ordered the album, apparently. Uh, but then they just added it into the album anyway. Yeah, pre-ordering is weird. Um, so I think it's pretty obvious what this song's about. A drunken night out, waking up the morning after, and remembering nothing about what happened. Uh, possibly as a continuation of Victorious, this song might actually depict the morning after... And, you know, we all know what that's like, you know, waking up the morning after a drunken night. Um, I personally can't relate because I don't really drink that often. And when I do, I've never gotten to the point of actually being full-on drunk. <laughs> a lot of people have been like, you know, it's not all it's cracked up to be. A lot of people are like, you know, it actually sucks uh, not having any control over your body. Which I get. Which is also why I've never gotten drunk. Also, can I just mention just how weird the music video is? So, okay, so... Here, let me paint you a picture, alright? For the music video of Don't Threaten Me With A Good Time. It's a POV video, alright? Uh, you are from the perspective of a woman, presumably, who Brendan flirts with. So you're from the POV... You're looking at the POV, the point of view... Uh, of whoever Brendan's flirting with. The two of them end up going up into a bedroom uh, for things to get more intense, and it does get more intense, because it turns out that you are a, tent a tentacle monster that then murders Brendan and tosses his corpse outside. Like, what does this have to do with anything? Brendan, explain! EXPLAIN YOURSELF! WHAT IS WITH THIS TENTACLE MONSTER?! So, I'm just gonna go ahead and, uh, remain... Try and, you know, purge that memory from my mind. And I'm gonna judge the song as a song, not as a music video. So anyway, uh, don't threaten me with a good time. I give this one a 7.5 out of 10. The lyrics are better than Victorious, but the instrumental is slightly weaker. This song still slaps, but not quite as hard. So, next up, we get Hallelujah. Ooh, I wonder if this will be a cover of the Leonard Cohen song. Interestingly enough, I think, from what I remember, the Leonard Cohen song Hallelujah, you know the one. You, trust me, you know the one. 
I think that song has, like, has been covered by more artists than any other song. I think it's meant to be, like, the most heavily covered song of all time. Uh, but nope! Panic at the Disco's Hallelujah is a completely original song that just happens to have the same name. Uh, so, we get trumpets. Nice. Also, we get a slower, more jazzy sound than the previous two. Uh, the chorus sounds pretty cool. It's just as loud, but slower than the previous two songs. It's louder, but it's not quite as explosive, if you know what I mean. Uh, the verses have a rather familiar sounding instrumental. Like, I feel like I've heard this backing many, many times before. I don't think I really like it. Um, the lyrics also repeat themselves quite a bit. Actually, not even. Like, the chorus is the same each time. And I mean, like, even one chorus repeats itself repeatedly. So, one chorus, uh... One chorus says the word hallelujah six times per chorus, and each one repeats the phrase say your prayers three times in a row. I know this might seem like I'm nitpicking because, like, heaps of other songs do this, and the thing is, like, sometimes in songs that repetition works, but... And I think it works fine in, like, other Panic songs, but here it just makes it all feel very samey. We do get some very nice vocals, though. It sounds almost gospel-y. Um, however, soon as I wrote that, I got to, like, the lyrics, you'll never know if you don't ever try again. Uh, and it just sounds too strained. Like, I know that Brendan can hit super high notes, and he can hit notes higher than this, but like, I don't know. Th here it just sounded too strained. Anyway, we get the instrumental cuts, and then we get claps to the beat. Very, very common thing. It's all, it's always, it's usually quite cool when that happens. Um, also, eventually the claps stop as well, and so then we just get singing a cappella. Um, and then it ends. It felt like a very short song. It was th three minutes exactly, which is weird because I was looking through the, the, like how long each song went for. Victorious is actually a shorter song, but it still felt longer. Weird. I don't know. Maybe it's the fact that the beat is slower in Hallelujah. Uh, also, this was the very first song that Panic had released without Spencer Smith. This is actually quite the landmark song. And it's, as far as what it means, Hallelujah is basically a thank you song, worshipping uh, the fans who made Brendan's dream possible, which is actually a really cool way of thanking your fans. That's a real Chad move right there. So I give Hallelujah a 6 out of 10. It's really cool that this was for the fans, and honestly, I don't hate this song at all. Like, I won't... I don't think I'd even say that I dislike it, but it just sounds a bit too generic to me. Maybe also it feels a bit disjointed with the song being too slow-paced for the amount of energy the vocals are. I don't know, it just feels kind of meh. But only kind of, which is why I didn't give it a 5. Anyway, so next up... We have The Emperor's New Clothes. Now, fun fact, this was actually the first Panic song that I listened to knowing that it was a Panic song. Um, like, I had heard, I think, Nine in the Afternoon and This Is Gospel beforehand, but I didn't actually know that they were Panic songs until after I would listened to it. Emperor's New Clothes is the first one that I went into being like, okay, so this is a Panic at the Disco song. Let's see what it's about. Also, this song's music video is actually a sequel to This Is Gospel. When we last, when we last met our hero Brendan Urie, his soul had just run away from him and was running into the light. Now we see that he has gone up into heaven. Psych. Bitch, he's actually falling into hell and turning into a demon. 
that sounds like fun. So we get a very interesting start here. Uh, we get some interesting vocal effects. We get a strong drum beat that combines with some bass. Um, and, I don't know, the lyrics are really good at, like, setting this sinister vibe to it. And then, uh, we get to the chorus. Explosive vocals. Uh, the instrumental, a lot less explosive. It's kind of weak, actually. Not much different to the verses. Uh, like I said before, the lyrics are quite nice. They sound quite sinister. And they conjure interesting images. Uh, there's a little delay uh, before going into the second chorus, which sounds really cool. Little split second of anticipation. Um, I would say, the bridge sounds sick. Uh, it sounds like a dark circus or an evil circus. It sounds awesome. I love it. And we get a really awesome high note. Again, uh, uh, the vocals really make this song. I can't stress enough that the vocals really make this song. The instrumental sounds interesting, but it really doesn't change things up. And I just always think back to this, uh... This YouTube video that I saw, um, the video has since been taken down, and the only version that's still on YouTube is, like, a Nightcore version of the song, which, you know, isn't the same thing, obviously, because if you don't know, Nightcore is basically just when you take a song, uh, you speed it up and heighten the pitch, and then that's it. Um... Oh, and then you also have, like, uh, the video be, like, uh, an anime character of some kind. But, I ended up... Yeah, so I saw a video that was, like, a mashup between this song, Emperor's New Clothes, and, uh... Uh, and Fall Out Boy's Centuries. Um, and it was... As far as I'm concerned, it improved both songs because it was like it combined like the really sick instrumentals in centuries with the explosive vocals in emperor's new clothes it sounded awesome and i think it like actually fixed the two weaknesses uh that the songs have they complemented each other really nicely i would recommend it if it was still on YouTube, but it is what it is. So, this song is apparently about somebody indulging in evil and a desire for power. The title also references the Hans Christian Andersen story of the same name. Obviously, it's all about the that emperor that gets, like, these tailors who trick him by, like, being like, oh, we've got these, like, special clothes, um... That, like, if you, like, only intelligent people, uh, can see them, uh, and he didn't, he didn't want to admit that he can't see the clothes, uh, so, or he didn't want to admit that he wasn't intelligent, so he just pretended that he could see the clothes, um, and then walked out, uh, into public naked, uh, and then it was like, like, a little child called him out on it, because obviously the kid's not gonna be, you know, concerned about that. And so, yeah. Apparently, this is the Emperor. However, unlike the Emperor, this character is aware of his foolishness, but still wants the glory. So, overall, I would give Emperor's New Clothes a 7.5 out of 10. This actually used to be my favorite Panic song for a while, but upon closer inspection, the chorus isn't as punchy as I used to see it as. It's still quite foreboding with a strong beat, which is cool, but the instrumental is a bit too weak for it to be placed any higher. As I said before, however, vocals are excellent in this song. It's great. So next we have Death of a Bachelor. Now, this song is regarded by many as being Panic's best song, or at least one of the best. In fact, as far as I know, 
every single album has a song in it that somebody thinks is the best. I know, um, Phoebe, you can't sweat out. Everybody says, like, some people say, I write sins, not tragedies, is the best ever. Nine in the afternoon, uh, um, I mean, pretty odd. I think, uh, quite a few people say nine in the afternoon's the best. Vices and Virtues, we got people saying Ballad of Mona Lisa is the best. Too Weird to Live, Too Rare to Die, people say This is Gospel is the best. And Death of a Bachelor, people say Death of a Bachelor is the best. So, wow. Anyway, this song, yeah. It's also been said by many to be uh, the most difficult Panic at the Disco song to sing. Because you need the biggest range in order to sing it. Uh, there are some songs which is like, you know, like there are some songs that are like, you're gonna have more difficulty singing them if you're a bass, and then others you're gonna have more difficulty singing if you're a soprano. Apparently this one is gonna, is like the most difficult overall, because you gotta go high and low in it. So anyway, we get a rather disjointed intro, it kind of sounds like a, a broken record, or a, like a carnival that like, has a broken faulty player or something like that. Uh, we get a very jazzy Frank Sinatra style song. This is like heavily Frank Sinatra inspired. Uh, the singing definitely feels very different to the others. It's very like, I don't know, it's a lot smoother than a lot of the other songs. Um, we also get some very nice sax. And let me tell you, sax is great. I reckon more songs need to have saxophones in them. Because saxes are great. Uh, the vocals are also... The vocals are very good. Especially the chorus. Uh, Brendan really gets to show his uh, singing chops in this song. Sometimes it sounds like he is straining to hit some of the higher notes, though. But, vocals are still very good. Uh, the instrumental is pretty fine. Uh, it's not super explosive, but is enough so. Not to mention that this song obviously isn't meant to be the same type of vibe as some of the earlier songs. Um, the bridge sounds like a carnival track that's broken and chopping around. Kind of like the intro, actually. Uh, the song sounds really good, but it doesn't change around at all. The first and third chorus and the first and second verses sound exactly the same as each other. Um... Yeah. There is, like, a slight difference in the choruses, first and third time, but, like, you know, tiny difference. So this song is about where Brendan feels as a person right now. Mostly why he had named the album after this song, actually. Um... Uh, I'll actually get up the direct quote for this song, uh, by Brendan himself. Um, because... I mean, he would likely explain it better. So, he says, uh, I would say the title track, Death of a Bachelor, is pretty much why I called the album that. Just really meant a lot to me. I mean, that kind of summed up how I feel now. I feel I'm a new person, and I'm able to talk about the past because I'm not that person anymore. It's nice to be able to set aside the past and look at it objectively, instead of being stuck in that world. So that was really an eye-opening experience to me. So yeah, that's uh, that's kind of what Death of a Bachelor is about. It's all about how new of a person he feels and is almost reminiscing on his prior life as a bachelor and how he's moved past that. What do I think of the song overall? I'd give it an 8 out of 10. It's a nice sound, it's a very different sound to the album up to this point. Exceptional vocals. But the song isn't super dynamic, and doesn't change up the sound that much. It stays pretty much the same. Uh, but, obviously, 8 out of 10 is still a very good mark. Like, this would be a high distinction in university. So, next up, we get, um... We have Crazy Equals Genius. Uh, we open with some trumpets. Very nice intro. Uh... And we have, like, some chorus in- some choir in the background, um, repeating the same verse. It's a very upbeat sound, uh, and the vocals have a really good rhythm to them. 
Uh, we get a very weird pre-chorus, uh, mostly because of the lyrics. Um, like, let me get the lyrics up here, just to show you what I'm dealing with here. Or just explain to you what I'm dealing with. So, the pre-chorus is like, She said you're just like Mike Love, but you want to be Brian Wilson. Brian Wilson said you're just like Mike Love, but you'll never be Brian Wilson. Who is- who? 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 Wait, okay, hold on. So... Apparently they are the co-founders of the Beach Boys. Uh, Wilson is known for being a musical genius and is highly regarded for his work. Uh, on the other hand, Love is only really known for his lyrics, which can be simple and mediocre at times. And he's often regarded as someone who's in it for the money. Oh, jeez. Alright. Call out. Anyway, so then we move to the chorus. And let me tell you, that chorus is just primal. Like, the guitar is dirty. The trumpets are perfect. And the vocals are sick. Ugh. Teal dear, it's awesome. The trumpets are definitely, uh, the trumpeteers are definitely having fun during this song as well. You can tell, they got their whole thing going on there. Um, also, I will commend the lyrics for one thing. Uh, one of the lyrics, one of the lines, um, uh, oh, uh, other boys you may have dated serrated your heart with a slice. But the cut of your love never hurts, baby. It's a sweet butter knife. That's a, that's a nice image. Like, serrated your heart with a slice. Like, with a nut. Yeah. With a slice. That's a really nice image. And then we get back to that chorus. Just... Oh! I love it. Oh, but actually, before that, the uh, pre-chorus, we get Dennis Wilson, who's apparently another co-founder of the Beach Boys, uh, who's apparently the stage drummer for the band. Brian and Dennis were very different boys in their character. Dennis was friends with Charles Manson for a while. <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, Dennis was the middle brother, with Brian being the oldest. Dennis was the only true surfeit of the group. And Dennis died at uh, age 39 via drowning while swimming drunk. Oh, jeez. All right. Um, however, in addition, there is a thing that they both have in common. In addition to the fact that both were bullied by their father and had major drug issues, both Wilson boys were amazing music writers, and it especially shows in Dennis's solo work. Dennis's musicianship was yet again far beyond that of Mike Love, and as a result, the narrator wishes to be like him too. Jeez, like, poor Mike Love, like, it's getting called out here. But yeah, that chorus is just, oh, I love it. Like, this song in general almost sounds like a Disney villain song. If it weren't for the fact that they drop an F-bomb in there, like, I reckon it would be perfect for a Disney villain song. Um... Also, uh, if crazy equals genius, very relatable sound, very relatable sound, uh, that bridge is like, it's very arsonisty how they just keep repeating you can set yourself on fire. And then, okay, so then, uh, after the bridge, it's like, the lyric, the, all the instrumentals stop for like a second, and it's like, you think that the song's finished, and then the trumpets come back in and are like, Brrr! it's like, oh, we're not done yet! Ah, oh, it really brings everything back out with a huge bang. Everything about this is really sick. Like, ah, oh. this kind of shows how sometimes the same sound works better than others. Like, this song is still rather samey, although it changes things up enough to not be exactly the same. Uh, but honestly, the music is so sick that you just want to hear more of it. So anyway, this song makes um, a statement about whether there is a link between insanity and creativity, 
which was apparently made famous by uh, Rob Siltonen in the uh, Apples Think Different campaign. Uh, what what did he have to say about it? Um, so, in Apple's Think Different campaign, there's a quote that says, Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you cut about the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward, and while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Dang, that's actually oh, that's actually quite profound. Interesting. Hmm. It really makes you think. I don't know. Maybe next time someone calls me crazy, I'm going to take it as a compliment. Anyway, I give this song a 9.5 out of 10. This song is primal. It has such a sick sound. And the lyrics complement it supremely. I love the craziness so much. I just realized that I seem to have a thing for the more sinister sounds. Because I know I had said that... um. Uh, Casual Affair was my favorite in the last album. So, huh. Interesting. Well, this concludes the first part of Death of a Bachelor. Uh, please, join in next time, where I'll cover the second half of it. That ought to be fun, shouldn't it? But, until then, I'll see you guys. Uh, take it easy. Have a good one.